this unit of instruction is all about learning and memory. Now, learning in psychology doesn't mean what you're doing right now. What you're doing right now and every time you come to a class is not learning. It's memory construction. You're creating memories. So when we hear the word learning in psychology, what you need to think of right away is changes in behavior. Learning in psychology means changing your behavior based on previous experience or practice. Um, some fun facts about learning before we move on. First of all, anything you learn can be unlearned. You can have behaviors that you've learned diminish over time or disappear or be replaced. Secondly, you can learn things purely by observation, by watching people without actually participating yourself. And finally, uh, anything that you're going to learn, any new behaviors you're going to learn, require an operational memory system in order to function, which I think would be fairly obvious. Now, there are several types of learning, but the first type of learning we're going to cover today is called classical conditioning. It's called classical conditioning because it was invented first. It was discovered by this guy, a Russian physiologist named Ivan Pavlov, or if you like, Ivan Pavlov. He discovered it in 1905, but he did it completely by accident. Um, he, was he was just studying the physiology of dogs and like how much drool they create. And he discovered it uh, by accident when a bell was going off in the building he was studying classical conditioning in. He decided to turn it into a formal experiment. Uh, later, he discovered he received the Nobel Prize for his discovery. So how cool is that, getting a Nobel Prize for something you discovered by accident? But the point of classical conditioning is that it's learning by association. What that means is that you're connecting two stimuli together. So you're saying, here's this thing, here's this other thing, my brain says they're equal. And that's what association means, is connecting two stimuli together or having your brain think they mean the same thing. Um, so let's take a little bit of a look at what that looks like. Now this is how Pavlov's experiment was set up. Now don't worry, there were no dogs actually harmed in this, he just has them strapped in these harnesses so they can't move. So what he would do is he would put them in this harness and then put a little tube in their mouth to measure how much drool they would create or how much saliva they would create. And then he would ring a little bell. And every time he rang that little bell, he would show the dog some food. Now, food naturally makes dogs start drooling. Anybody who owns a dog and, like, eats a snack near them gets that. My dog especially gets these big droopy chains of drool on his face, and it's really gross. So that food is naturally making the dogs drool. And what Pavlov is trying to do is see if he can get that bell to make the dogs drool the same amount. So let's break this experiment down a little bit more. Um, first, Pavlov would ring the bell, and then he would show the dogs the food. So the food is called an unconditioned stimulus here, and what that means is conditioning means training. So if it's unconditioned, it's something we didn't have to train. It's not trained, it's natural. It's pre-existing, it's inborn or innate in the dog to drool when he sees food. So the food is an unconditioned or untrained stimulus, and the drooling is an unconditioned or untrained response. So what Pavlov is doing is ringing the bell and then showing the food in a close proximity to each other. So bell, food, bell, food, bell, food. And eventually, the bell starts to become equal to the food in the dog's brain. So the dog is now thinking, oh, bell and food mean the same thing. So every time I hear that bell, I'm going to drool just the same way I would if I saw the food, because I know food's about to come. So that's how this experiment works. By getting the dogs to associate the ringing of the bell with the presence of the food, he's having both stimuli cause the same response. And that's what classical conditioning is all about. Well, let's just pause briefly on this comic strip. The caption, if you can't read it from the back of the room, says, I think mom's using the can opener. Does it look familiar to anybody? If you shake a bag of dog food or you open a can, even if it's like a can of green beans and it has nothing to do with dog or cat food, your pet is suddenly all up in your business. That's classical conditioning too. Your pet has learned that that shaking noise of the dry food or the opening of a treat jar, which is something that my dog has conditioned himself to think is important, will, they will automatically show up thinking they're about to feed them. It's the same process as Pavlov's dogs drooling at the sound of a bell. It just happened more naturally in the environment instead of having to have a scientist do it. Now comes the uh, difficult part about classical conditioning, and that's the terminology. There are a lot of 
big words in this section and they all kind of sound pretty similar so it's important that you practice these and the best way to practice them is rather than just straight memorizing what they mean the point that I want you to get to is to try to break them down what are the individual pieces of these words mean just learn those and learn them really well and then you can put them together and go oh that's what that means rather than having to try to just memorize some definitions that don't sound very natural anyway so let's start with the relationship between the stimulus and the response. Okay, now a stimulus is any signal from the environment. It can be anything. It can be a bell. It can be the smell of cake. It can be a picture on the wall. It can be a sm like a eating something. Anything from the environment that your senses take in, that's a stimulus. Now a response is a reaction that you have to that stimulus. If I ask you a question, the question is the stimulus. Your answer is the response. It's the result that you have. Okay, so stimulus is a signal from the environment and a response is a behavior. Now let's talk about the word conditioned a little bit. We kind of already covered this, but if you think about in sports, conditioning means like training or getting ready for something, like lifting weights or running or doing something, right? So conditioning in psychology means the same thing. It means training or learning something. So an unconditioned thing then is going to be something that's untrained or not trained. If I don't have to train you something, it means you already know it, right? I don't have to train dogs to enjoy food. They naturally do. I don't have to train people, specifically teenagers, to enjoy sleeping. You automatically enjoy sleeping, right? So I didn't have to teach you that. It's unconditioned, right? So an unconditioned stimulus then is an untrained signal from the environment, something that's naturally going to get you to do a reaction every time. Like if I showed a dog a piece of treat, right, or food. He's naturally going to drool. So the food, then, is the stimulus, the unconditioned stimulus, and the drool is the unconditioned response. Okay? Now, let's talk about the neutral stimulus. Something is neutral because it's not connected to anything else. It's not involved, right? Switzerland is neutral in World War II because they're not allied with anybody. They're just neutral. They don't have any connections to anything. They're not involved, right? So a neutral stimulus then in classical conditioning is some stimulus that's not relevant. It's not involved. You haven't been taught it before. You have no idea what it is. It's not important to you. In this example, that would be the bell, right? Because at the beginning, the dogs don't care about the bell ringing or not ringing. It's not important to them. So it's neutral. It's Switzerland. It's unconnected. Now, our last two terms in classical conditioning are the conditioned stimulus and the conditioned response. So remember, again, a stimulus is a signal from the environment, and a response is some behavior or reaction that you have. So if an unconditioned stimulus is something that's not trained or it's natural, then a conditioned stimulus must be something that you have to be trained to follow. Right? So the conditioned stimulus is something that over time or after it's been associated a number of times with the unconditioned stimulus, you learn it. It turns into a conditioned pattern. Okay? And then a conditioned response is something that you're trained to do, a behavior you're trained to do, rather than something that's natural or pre-existing. So a conditioned stimulus is something that you're trained to listen to or follow, and a conditioned response is a tr behavior that you're trained to do. So if you think about it, the conditioned stimulus is the bell. The dogs have to be trained to listen to the bell. But it's not the bell at the beginning of the experiment before anything happened. That's when the bell is neutral. The bell becomes conditioned. It switches from neutral to conditioned by, by association, by practice, right? So you keep repeating bell, food, bell, food, bell, food. Over time, the bell, which used to be neutral, we like didn't care, now your brain thinks they're the same thing. So the bell becomes a conditioned stimulus now where it wasn't conditioned before then the response is the same. In both cases, the response is drooling. It's just at the beginning, it's unconditioned response because you're doing it to something natural, which is the food. And at the end, it's a conditioned response because you're doing it as a result of a conditioned stimulus of training. Now remember, the point of classical conditioning is to learn new behaviors by association. So the whole way that you accomplish classical conditioning is by repeatedly pairing the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus to make an association over time. So this is not something that you can do just once or overnight. You have to do a lot of repetitions to maintain it and keep, it, keep that association growing. Um, classical conditioning really works best 
when the conditioned or neutral stimulus comes first before the unconditioned stimulus. So you need to have bell first, then food, not the other way. Also, they need to be pretty close in time with each other. You can't ring a bell and then 20 minutes later show them food. The dog's not going to make that connection, so it has to be pretty close in time. Um, and eventually, if you repeat these associations enough, you're going to get the neutral stimulus to become conditioned and give you a conditioned response that's basically the same as the unconditioned response. Are you ready to practice? Okay, so before we get into practicing with some examples, I want you to write down this paradigm in your notes. Now, a paradigm is just a fancy science word for like a method of thinking about something or a way to approach something. It's kind of like a recipe for cooking. It doesn't actually help you cook the food, it just gives you a framework for how to do it. Okay, so the paradigm for classical conditioning, and what I want you to do is take these three lines that I have on the screen and put a bunch of space in them, in between them in your notebook. So like UCS, arrow, UCR, and then skip like three lines. And then do another line, NS leads to UCS, leads to UCR, skip three more lines. And then have CS and CR, and make sure you line them up the way I have them lined up. So UCR, UCR, CR on the, in the, on the far right, the unconditioned stimuli in the middle, and then the neutral stimulus and the conditioned stimulus on the other end. Um, so you leave some spaces, that way you can fill in the examples underneath it and will help you understand. Okay, so take a few minutes, fill this in. Uh, please don't advance the slides until you have everybody having written everything down. Okay, so here's our first example. I've done these in pictures rather than in words because I think the pictures make it easier to remember. Um, so this example, again, is Pavlov. I know I feel like I'm a broken record that I just keep using the same examples over and over, but it's a pretty classic example and I think it will help you understand the paradigm. Then we're going to move on to a new example on the next slide. Okay, so in Pavlov's experiment, the unconditioned stimulus is the food because we don't have to teach dogs to follow it, it's untrained. And then the unconditioned response is the dog drooling. So every time the dog sees food, he's going to drool. That's natural and pre-existing. You can't accomplish classical conditioning without some pre-existing UCS and UCR relationship. If you don't have that, it's not going to work. Next, we have a neutral stimulus, which in this case is the bell. We keep pairing the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. We're going to repeat that pairing several times. So the second line of the paradigm, you're going to do the second line a bunch of times. These are called training trials. That's a bullet on a later slide, so you'll be able to write that down, don't worry. So you repeat this, neutral stimulus plus the unconditioned. So at this stage, you still have the unconditioned stimulus, or UCS, causing the drool. The, the food is making the dog's drool here, not the bell yet. We're just trying to repeat this to build that association. Then, at the very end, after enough re repetitions of these training trials, the neutral stimulus is going to become the conditioned stimulus. The NS becomes the CS, and then the conditioned stimulus, the bell now, is causing the dog to drool, not the food. We don't need the food anymore. The dog's been trained. Okay, now it's time for a unique example, a new example. Now, the cool thing about classical conditioning is that you can train literally any behavior you want to, to respond to any stimulus you can think of. As long as you have a pre-existing unconditioned stimulus that will cause that response you're looking for, you can train anything. Um, even if the person knows it's happening, it still works. That's the cool thing about classical conditioning. It can apply to any behavior because it's not a voluntary response. It's automatic. Okay, so this example is something that actually happened in real life. I have a friend who is an actor, and when we were still in college together, um, he was having some trouble uh, learning to make his eyes water on command, because sometimes actors need to be able to cry or look convincing when they cry. He could make the facial expression, but he couldn't really make the tears come out. So I had an idea, why don't we use classical conditioning? So we needed something that naturally makes a person's eyes water. And what we landed on was onions. Onions create a chemical when you cut them that irritates the corneas of your eyes. It makes them water, makes your eyes water. Uh, anytime you've tried to chop onions cooking, you should have figured that out, right? So the unconditioned stimulus here would be onions or the juice from onions. And the unconditioned response then is crying or having your eyes water. 
Okay, so then he had a particular little whistle that he was able to carry with him, and we would blow the whistle and then put onions near his eyes, and then that would make his eyes water. We repeated this several times. So the whistle is the neutral stimulus. The onion is still making his eyes water at this point, not the whistle yet. We repeat this a bunch of times, and eventually you can blow that whistle, and his eyes will start to water automatically because they're anticipating having that exposure to the chemical from the onions. So that's classical conditioning as well, and this was able to help him grow as an actor and get better. He doesn't need that crutch anymore, but it was helpful to him when we were in college. Okay, now this next one I want you to do on your own. In your notes, under that paradigm, the same one you've been doing with the other examples, I want you to label the unconditioned stimulus unconditioned response, neutral stimulus, conditioned stimulus, and conditioned response for the example that's on the screen. So let's say that whenever you raise your hand in class, I call on you. That just naturally happens, right? Then you start smacking your desk, the surface of your desk, every time you raise your hand. So eventually, I start calling on you after you smack your desk without you needing to raise your hand. Break down this example, the, um, the teacher should have the right answers. So classical conditioning is involved in a lot of different behaviors that we engage in every day. Um, it can be, I think the longer you think about this, the more examples you're going to think of because it kind of is subtle, but we have a lot of them. Here's some examples. Um, if you have a song that makes you think of a particular person, maybe you went on a like fun beach vacation with somebody and this song played in the car while you were with them. Now every time you hear that song, you're gonna think of that person. That's classical conditioning. The song is a neutral stimulus that you have so associated with the presence of your friend, which was the unconditioned stimulus. So now thinking of that friend happens as a result of the music in addition to them being there. Um, or if anybody has a food that makes them feel sick, like maybe you got the flu after eating a piece of birthday cake, and so now every time you are near birthday cake or eat some birthday cake, it makes you feel nauseous. That's classical conditioning too. Or think of fears, things that are people are really afraid of. Maybe something scary happened to them while they were in the presence of that stimulus and now they have a fear of that thing as a result. These are all examples of classical conditioning. Now finally, here are some pointers or tips that make classical conditioning the most effective. First of all, like I said, the neutral stimulus needs to come before the conditioned stimulus, and it needs to be about a half second apart or less. Any significant distance of time between the NS and the UCS, you won't form that association as easily. So they need to be pretty close together, but the NS needs to come first. Secondly, every time you repeat showing the neutral stimulus and then showing the unconditioned stimulus, ringing the bell and then showing the food, is called a training trial, like I said before. If you show the conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus, this is called an extinction trial. If you really think about it, to go extinct means for something to disappear or cease to exist, right? So if I showed you the conditioned stimulus, if I rang that bell, but didn't show you any food, then you'd start to think, oh, well, I thought that every time a bell rang, I got food, but apparently I don't, so I guess I'm not gonna care about this bell anymore. And it kind of diminishes the training. So if you want classical conditioning to be effective, you really have to maintain it and keep reinforcing that association with the unconditioned stimulus for it to be kept for a long time. Um, lastly, the intensity of the unconditioned stimulus matters for how quickly this training can happen. So if you have something that's a really, really intense, really, really strong unconditioned stimulus, like something very scary, um, like let's say you almost drowned while you were at Myrtle Beach and now you like hate Myrtle Beach and won't go there, that's because that almost drowning experience is a really strong unconditioned stimulus that you've associated with that location. Or um, like if you like phobias, fears, really severe fears of things are often conditioned only after one exposure to the unconditioned stimulus because of how strong it is. But if it's something really mild, um, like the desk slapping example from before, that unconditioned stimulus of raising your hand, that's not very intense. So it's going to take a lot of training trials in order for that behavior to be trained. Um, so the intensity of the unconditioned stimulus influences the speed of classical conditioning.